This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Malt. Diastatic or non-diastatic malt. Malt syrup, malted milk powder, chocolate malteds, malted milk balls, single malt scotch, malty beers. What even is malt? This truly magical ingredient is at once very simple and very complex. Simply, malt is any cereal grain that has been allowed to germinate, to sprout, meaning it has started growing into a new plant. Remember, the grain that we grind into flour and bake is the seed of a grass plant. That grain is malting in the field right there. When grain is sprouted like that, you can eat it raw or cooked, and it's particularly nutritious. I would bet you money that the way ancient humans first started malting grain is they took some dried grains that they had collected and they soaked them in water just to soften them up so they could chew them. The grains sprouted when they got wet, and then just gradually people started to realize that when the grain is sprouted like that, it has all of these amazing properties. For a fleeting moment, sprouted grain is full of enzymes that give us all these wonderful foods. You sprout the grain, you dry it, and then potentially do other things to it to create tons of amazing flavors. If you are not familiar with the malty flavor, Get ready for your life to improve. I'm gonna show you how I made my own malt. We're gonna learn the science of what exactly is going on inside these seeds and how they make foods and drinks so incredible. First thing you need for malt is grain, and it's gotta be intact whole grain that has been dried into dormancy but is still viable, still alive, basically. I happen to have some leftover wheat from that time that I grew wheat in my backyard and baked bread with it. I have two videos about that in the description. Wheat is not the most popular grain for making malt. Barley is the most popular grain for making malt, for reasons that we'll get to. But you can totally malt rice, rye, oats, corn, wheat, any of those. And my first step was to wash my wheat. All the good seeds sink to the bottom. What floats to the top are the dead seeds, bits of chaff, and other detritus that you can skim off. This process may also wash away some microorganisms that could cause the grains to spoil as you leave them submerged all day, ideally somewhere cool. It's still hot here in Tennessee, so I brought the bucket inside into the air conditioning. That night, I drained the water out and laid the grains out onto a tray. At this point, they already smelled a lot like bread or beer. I brought them inside and went to bed. The goal here is to trick the seeds into thinking that they have just been soaked in a nice, cool spring rain. They are evolved to start growing into a new plant when those rains come. The next day I repeated the process, submerged them for a day, drained them that evening, and then look, see that little white thing coming out there? My wheat sprouted after two soaks, two spring rains. The water is what gets the process going. That is Dr. Nathan Duncan, a chemistry professor at Maryville College here in Tennessee, where he teaches a science gen ed about beer. He says it all started during his own undergrad at Baylor University in Texas. My roommate and I, where we had been interested in beer. So far, that sounds like literally anyone's college experience. Uh, we spent a lot of our senior year brewing beer, and I've been doing it ever since. Ah, well, I guess not every college kid does that, nor do they all end up becoming organic chemists. But anyway, Dr. Duncan was saying that soaking the seeds to a little under 50% hydration kickstarts the malting process, which is... You start getting water into the seed, it starts activating the proteins, and those cells start coming to life and they start producing uh, proteins called amylases. Amylase, that's the enzyme we've been talking about. Enzymes are proteins. The seed is born with the amino acids necessary to build those proteins. And when we get the seed wet, we trigger a whole genetic process that builds proteins out of the amino acids that are in there. Most of us are probably more familiar with proteins that are the building blocks of tissues, like muscle and skin and bone. We are mostly made out of water and fats and proteins. A protein like amylase is not a building block. It's an enzyme because its primary function is to catalyze or start up a biological process. It's a protein that we use to do something, not be something. In this case, the seed makes amylase in order to catalyze a transformation of the starch inside the seed. The fluffy white stuff in there, that's the starch. Starch molecules are huge branches of sugars all linked together, sometimes thousands of sugars in a single starch molecule. And the, and the purpose of the starches is to provide food for the growing plant until it starts producing leaves that it can start doing photosynthesis and get its own energy. So that's the energy store for that plant. 
Problem is, the baby plant can't eat those sugars when they are polymerized into those giant starches. It uses the amylase enzyme to break those starches down into smaller or simpler sugars that it can eat. Most notably, maltose, which is a disaccharide consisting of two glucose units. The simple sugars like glucose are what are needed for the cells to uh, produce energy. And th so that's the process of cellular respiration. So after I got my wheat sprouted, I just kept spritzing it with water occasionally to keep it from drying out, and I turned my pile frequently to give every seed access to air. After a few days of doing that, they looked like this. The long spindly tendrils are the rootlets, baby roots that are aiming for the ground. That right there is the acrospire, or plumule. That's the above ground part of the plant aiming for the sky. If the seeds were outside in the dirt, the acrospires would eventually grow into these. These are growing from seeds I lost down the drain when I was washing my wheat. They got caught in my little filter under that grate and they germinated. That's new wheat growing in there. This acrospire is the same thing, it's just not as far along. With other grains, this early stage of acro spire growth actually happens entirely inside the seed. You have to cut one open and look inside in order to judge the acrospire's growth. With this wheat, the acrospire is growing entirely outside the seed, which is convenient for me because I need to measure how long it is. When the acrospire is almost as long as the seed itself, it's time for me to shut everything down. If you're a plant lover, it's a sad story. You, you start the plant growing, it, it starts to sprout, and then we remove it from water to dry it out to kill the plant so that it doesn't use up all the starch. Effectively, what we want to do is to get the process going just enough that we have a large portion of active amylase enzymes within the seed, but not so much that we use up all the starch. So in the babies go to die in the oven. At least that's how I'm gonna do it. In Scotland, they dry or kiln their malt on a big floor filled with tiny holes through which they pass hot air. Traditionally, the heat for the process was generated by burning the accumulated dead stuff from the bottom of bogs, aka peat. To this day, some Scotch whiskey makers expose their malt to peat smoke to give it a smoky taste. This distillery famously uses very heavily smoked malt, so it's a very heavily peated scotch. That's why it tastes like an ashtray, a delicious ashtray, but this distillery famously does not let any peat smoke at all touch its malt, and so it tastes not smoky or peaty at all. I love them both equally, like my children. But anyway, I didn't have a perforated floor for kilning my malt, so I just used my oven on its lowest setting and I cracked the door to allow moisture to escape and to keep the heat from getting too high in there. I'm trying to make what's called a base malt. Your base malts are dried slowly or at lower temperature to prevent killing the enzymes. Once you go up to higher temperatures, you absolutely denature those enzymes. You'll cook them. Enzymes are proteins, and you'll start cooking them at temperatures above 149 Fahrenheit 65 C. High temperatures over time deactivate the amylase, denature it. It really gets going above 180 Fahrenheit 85 C. At those temperatures, very rapidly, you are going to cook or denature the amylase, and you will render it totally incapable of converting any starches into sugars, which is the whole job of a base malt. Any maltster or company that's, that's producing malts will, one of the tests that they will do is a test for what they call the diastatic power of the malt. And essentially diastatic power is that malt's ability to convert starch into sugar or what percent remaining amylase is present. And so something like base malts have a very high diastatic power. Diastatic as in diastase. Diastase is basically an older term for amylase. This malt sold for bakers has lots of active enzymes in it. That's what the label is telling you. And why do we want those enzymes? We need the enzymes to make food for yeast. In order to ferment grains into alcohol or fluffy bread dough, you gotta break the starches in the grains down into sugars that the yeast can eat and ferment. The yeast will not ferment anything that is more than three glucose units long. And they really prefer to only ferment things that are one or two, which is why to really get your bread to rise, you add that teaspoon or tablespoon of sugar or a little bit of honey or something that is highly fermentable to it. 
On top of that, the bread yeast you buy have their own stores of energy inside their own little unicellular bodies, just like you can store energy inside your body. Plus, look at the ingredients on your bag of flour. Most bread flour and all-purpose flour at my store either has malt flour added, or in the ingredients they might just list enzymes. Really advanced bakers add their own enzymes to bread doughs in order to create certain types of rises and certain types of effects. In fact, there's research indicating that chronic exposure to amylase is an occupational hazard of baking. In certain people, at least, amylase can cause dermatitis and asthma when you're up to your elbows in flour and dough all day long. Bakers use amylase from malt in order to feed yeast, so the yeast will make carbon dioxide and raise doughs. Brewers and distillers use amylase to feed yeast, so that they will turn sugars into alcohol. This is a lager beer that one of Dr. Duncan's students is working on. You crush up some diastatic or base malt with other grains, and you soak them in water to make what's called a mash. You warm it up, the amylase breaks down all the starch into sugars, and then you have a sweet liquid called a wort. One of the reasons barley is more popular for making malt is that it has way less gluten than wheat does. So when you drain the wort or lauter the wort out of that big mass of grain parts, when you drain it out, it's going to drain cleanly. If you use wheat, you're going to have this glutinous, sticky mass that just won't drain. Like corn gets really gummy too if you try to mash corn. Now corn you add barley to it, you know, that's the whole thing. We can talk about bourbon for hours too, but uh, you know, you take corn, it's got starch, you use the enzymes from barley or malted wheat to convert those starches into sugar, but it still gets really gummy because of the proteins that are in there. So that's why barley is great for making malt. Plus, barley is really easy to grow, even in really cold climates. It has a nice mild taste, unlike rye, like rye has a really strong taste. Also, barley is terrible for making bread because it has very little gluten in it, so guess you might as well make malt with it. Anyway, once you drain your sweet wort, you add yeast to it. The yeast eat the sugars and poop out alcohol and carbon dioxide, and that's how you make beer or a similar liquid that you distill into whiskey. Or, instead of fermenting the wort with yeast, you could boil it down into a syrup, and that's what this is, malt syrup. It's used to add its particular malty flavor and color to baked goods, like New York-style bagels. But this syrup is non-diastatic, meaning it does not have any enzymatic power anymore. What they did was they malted some grains, sprouted some grains, and they let the grains convert a lot of their starch into sugar. Then they dried them to halt the process and also to keep them from molding or anything like that. And then they turned the heat up and they roasted the grains. That's what Dr. Duncan has here, a bunch of different roast levels of malt. At high heat, proteins and sugars have these browning reactions that make all kinds of amazing flavor compounds. The grains all by themselves are delicious. The lighter roasted ones taste like a milkshake. So another thing to do when you're trying these malts, now your saliva contains amylases. Crush it, let your spit kind of stew on it and hold it for a second, you'll notice it gets sweeter. The super dark roasted malts over here taste like cocoa powder or coffee. Brewers use different combinations of these to make different styles of beer. Your base malt, which is the one you simply dried, that's the one that is converting all of the starches in your mash into sugar for the yeast. The dark roasted malts that you add, those you're doing just for flavor. The darker you roast them, the less enzymatic power they have. They're just for flavor and color. And bakers use them for flavor too. Non-diastatic malt powder, roasted or otherwise deactivated malt ground into flour. It's full of maltose, which just has different chemical properties from sucrose or other sugars, and it makes bread crusts really brown. Malt powders also end up in beverages that are the polar opposite of beer and whiskey. I'm talking about the most innocent beverage of all, malted milk. In the late 19th century, a London pharmacist named James Horlick figured that he could make an easily digestible, shelf-stable drink mix for babies and sick people if he combined malt powder with milk powder and wheat flour. He called his mix diastoid, which was of course a terrible name for a food, so he called it malted milk instead. I believe some of you Brits still use the brand name Horlicks to refer generically to all malted milk powders, even though Horlicks is also a terrible name name for a food, but I guess that's never stopped you before. Malted milk became popular with outdoor enthusiasts as a preserved energy drink. 
And because it has those delicious malty flavors, it found popularity in milkshakes, often with chocolate added, and the malt shop here in the US became a symbol of mid-20th century innocence and abundance. And if you bake malted milk into a hard little biscuit and then coat it in chocolate, you get malted milk balls, Whoppers, which I really only know as that candy that I only ever saw on Halloween when it gradually concentrated in the bottom of my trick-or-treat bag because I ate everything else except for the Whoppers. Never really liked Whoppers. But you know what I have always liked? Squarespace. Use Squarespace to build and run a Whopper of a website. Whopper with a small w so as to indicate that I'm using the word generically now and not stepping on anyone's trademark in the context of doing an ad for Squarespace. Hey, have you heard? Squarespace has evolved to be everything you need to sell anything. Sell your products, your time, your content, your story. Squarespace has always had the inventory and the schedulers and the point of sale technologies to help you do your business on your website. And now they can help you make a video promo for your business too. Point out a page, choose a theme, and the video studio will pull your logo, your product, and your color palette automatically. With just a few clicks and zero editing, you'll have a high impact 30 to 60 second promo video. Squarespace truly is everything you need to build and run a business or personal website all in one place. You can start making one for free, but when you're ready to publish it or buy a domain name, use my code Ragusia and you'll save 10%. Link and code are in the description. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you, Dr. Nathan Duncan at Maryville College. Hey, you want to audit his beer class with me? Let's do it. Video coming soon.